So we'll start with some introductions. So um, Dr. Jude Kappa, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you. Brilliant. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yes, absolutely. So um, my name is Jude Kappa. I have various roles um, professionally. My main one day to day is that I'm an independent livestock sustainability consultant, um, but I also work with Kite Consulting. I'm the chair of the root panel for Agriculture, Environment and Animal Care at the Institute for Apprenticeships. And I've just joined the National Beef Association Board of literally about a week ago now. So um, lots of different irons in the fire. But what I do on a day to day basis essentially is to look at the environmental impacts of livestock production, principally dairy and beef, but other animals as well. And very much from the pro farm point of view. So not here to say that cattle kill the planet, for example. Thank you, Jude. Um, and Dave, Dave Knight, are you here too? Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. We can hear you. Please, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, my name's Dave Knight and um, I'm a sheep and beef farmer um, on Exmoor. We farm in the very uh, northeast corner of Exmoor in the dry bit. Um, we're predominantly an upland farm uh, running about 100 suckler cows uh, with all um, offspring uh, taking right through to finish. Um, and about 850 um, ewes, mostly uh, wool shedders now, um, a finish all land on farm. Um, and I also chair the Exmoor Hill Farm Network. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Exmoor Hill Farming Network? Uh, so the Exmoor Hill Farm Network was uh, started uh, just over five years ago now. Um, it's uh, run by uh, a board. Well, it's now now run by a board as we, we are a... Um, CIC uh, as of quite recently, but um, so effectively run as a, uh, run by a steering group or board, if you like, of um, farmer members. We have a few members also from um, stakeholder groups like the National Park. Uh, and really, we're sort of uh, we've set up to try and um, try and look after the farming community of Exmoor. Uh, our, our main role is uh, training, um, skills training. Uh, you know. It, it, it could be all sorts, really, anything from something led to like uh, trailer training um, right through to um, something that's purely educational, which might be an event, um, you know, might co-partner co with AHDB or we might do something with more value, you know, whoever, really. Um, uh, from a training point of view, we never were set up as a lobbying organisation, but uh, we seem to have found ourselves in a role of um, uh, putting together quite a significant um, piece of work called the Exmoor Ambition, uh, which is uh, sort of setting out our our ideals of um, a new environment scheme uh, for the future of where we would like it to be from a farming point of view. OK, thank you. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later yeah, as well. So um, in terms of an agenda for this evening, we'll start off, Jude, um, doing some myth busting. We'll then um, talk a bit more about practical applications from a farmer's point of view, Dave. I'm going to touch on carbon audit auditing or footprinting tools briefly, um, and then we'll wrap things up in around about an hour. So um, to our audience, uh, please do engage, use your chat function, and I'd like you to submit um, a myth that you've, you've heard or you've come across or perhaps you've been challenged with about livestock production and its effect on the environment. Um, try and think of one that you perhaps don't know how to answer yourself to make it a bit trickier. So Jude, I'll start. Um, I've heard that livestock production is one of the leading contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. You're not alone, because I seem to hear that about 5,000 times per day. Um, I think we have to put it on context, first of all. So there was a very, very um, famous report called Livestock's Long Shadow came out about 10 years ago now. And that was the first report where really sort of globally, we started thinking about things like greenhouse gas emissions and carbon footprint. They uh, cited that 17% of the world's carbon emissions basically come from animal agriculture. That's since been revised. It's now thought to be about 14, 1, 4%. Um, generally speaking, on a global basis, the biggest impact we actually have is from energy use, so burning um, fossil fuels. The, the, the sort of bad news bit of it is that 
as we calculate it at the moment, and that may change, you know, relatively soon, but as we calculate it at the moment, cattle and sheep do have higher greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of beef or per kilo of lamb than, say, pigs and poultry. Um, I say as we calculate it at the moment, there's some new science coming out of Oxford University called Global Warming, Pl um, Global Warming Star. That seems to imply that methane, which is the main greenhouse gas that comes from livestock, hasn't had the impact that we think it's had. So we may actually see up to a 60% decrease in our carbon footprints, both for beef, dairy and sheep, which would be great news for our industry. Um, but it's a difficult, it's a difficult myth to bust because it's so pervasive. And to some degree, we do have to own that if we have ruminant livestock, they do produce methane. Um, but the industry as a whole um, has done some really fabulous things. We've improved productivity over the years. We've improved slaughter weights. We've improved growth rates. And if we do that, then we cut the carbon footprint. So that's a real positive for our industry. It's really cool. Dave, from a farmer's point of view, what have you heard? Are there any myths that you've come across? Yeah, a fairly regular one I think we see um, thrown about is, uh, the, is, is the attempting link of red meat to, um, to, to cancers, uh, I guess particularly bowel cancer. Um, and that seems to be one that's thrown around rather a lot. And um, well, I guess it, it'd, be, it'd be handy for us as farmers to, you know, you know is there any truth in it? Um, and how do we sort of, push back that myth if it is one. That's one that I hear all the time as well. Um, there was some work done and the, the governing body who sort of classify and um, compounds that cause cancer, as it were, has classified red meat as a probable carcinogen, but that's the same category as lots of other things as well. Um, hairdressing chemicals, sunlight, alcohol, etc. There is no definitive work as far as I'm aware to show that red meat causes cancer. There may be an association, but there's no direct causal. If you eat this pork chop or you eat this steak, you, know, you will get cancer in this amount of time. And there was a study that came out several years ago, now about five years ago, and it seemed to quote that if you ate about 50 grams of bacon, which was about two to three pieces per day, you would have a 20% increase in the risk of having bowel cancer. Now, I'm a cancer survivor, so I'm never going to sort of downplay the, the um, issues with cancer, obviously. But I think it's really important to bear in mind that in, in this country, if you don't have a family history of, of um, bowel cancer, then you've only got about a 5% risk of getting it in your lifetime. So a 20% increase in that risk means you've then got a 6% risk of getting bowel cancer. So effectively, according to this data, you could eat bacon every single day. It would increase your risk from a 5% chance to a 6% chance, i.e. you've still got a 94% chance of not getting bowel cancer. Um, and that work didn't take into account other factors. You know, if you exercise, if you eat a lot of fiber, if you do all the positive things, if you have a healthy weight, if you don't smoke, if you don't drink excess alcohol, all of those things weren't considered. So we honestly don't know at the moment whether if you run two miles a day and you don't drink too much and you eat bacon, what the relative risks are. But there is no definitive um, sort of we fed 87 people some bacon and they all got cancer evidence out there. There are links and associations based on data, but there is no this is a cause evidence out there. And there are lots of positive health benefits associated with red meat. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if we look at the nutritional composition in terms of iron, um, for example, we know that that a significant proportion of young women, particularly are iron deficient in our population. Red meat is a fabulous source of that. It's a great source of high quality protein, essential fatty acids, minerals, et cetera. And to bring it back to environment just for a second, we have tended to concentrate on a kilo of beef or a liter of milk. And I think as we move forward and as we understand more about this topic, what's going to be really important is not just saying a 
litre of milk has a carbon footprint of, let's say, you know, 1.2 compared to orange juice, soy juice, hemp juice, it'll be what does that milk give us in terms of protein, energy, vitamins, minerals that we don't get from other drinks. And so we both as a meat industry and and as a dairy industry have a really good story to tell in terms of not just our carbon emissions, but the nutrition that we get from those foods for that carbon. And of course, bearing in mind that carbon isn't the only topic. You know, we have yeah. huge advantages um, for the environment. It isn't just about carbon. Joseph, what have we got coming in on the chat? <clears throat> so yeah, we have um, a few questions starting to come in. Um, so kind of around the, the carbon side of the story. Um, is it true the world's grasslands absorb more carbon dioxide than the world's forests, making grass fed oh. beef slightly better than for greenhouse grass emissions? I think that's for you, Jude. <laughs> that's that is that is a really good question, and it's one that I've had um, various times. So there's quite a lot of work from Rothamsted Northwick down in Devon, and they've looked at carbon sequestration, i.e., taking carbon out of the air, putting it into land. It is very difficult to generalise because it depends how you manage that grassland and it depends how you manage that forest and what sort of tree it is and what the inputs are. They both have their benefits. I'm not sure there's a definitive, this patch of land would be better in trees than grass, for example, um, because obviously one of the issues we have with the trees, if you cut them down or burn them, then it's all, you know, gone instantly. Um, Basically, they both have their place and where we could potentially have an impact would be not only having a grassland, but planting more trees in that grassland and then a, a grazing around it. Um, obviously, to plant a tree in in the middle of a cornfield isn't uh, isn't something that many people wanted to take on the challenge of, um, but they definitely have a place. And then the next one is... Uh grassland upland uh, sequestration of carbon currently included in any greenhouse gas calculations for meat? That's a very good question. I know that Leah is going to talk about carbon tools later on. Um, most of them haven't included sequestration until now, but that is beginning to change. And again, that is because it's so difficult to kind of have an average value for as it were it'll depend on your climate on your soil on your crop whether you plow whether you're no-till on your inputs you know so on and so on so in the same way that we can't ever say all cattle are exactly the same i'll be different weight breed speed growth etc all soils aren't the same so to have a sort of average value for sequestration per ton per acre per hectare is really tricky, but we are beginning to get the science in place to get that into the tools. And that is really, really important because if we don't, then we do our industry a um, disservice, basically. Cool. Um, I think, Lee, if you want to go on to your next questions, I'll bring in the next few comments a bit later. OK, so how about the UK could feed our population solely on the food that livestock eat? Oh, I love this one and I hate this one. Yes, in theory, given the amount of land we've got, if we could grow, let's say, corn and apples and lettuce and cucumber on all of that land, we could presumably produce enough plant-based foods to feed everybody. But that's a presumably, because, you know, if you look at quite a large part of the UK as a whole, you know, quite a lot of Scotland, quite a lot of Wales, quite a lot of England even, Exmoor. You know, we have Exmoor, yeah, precisely. You know, avocados are great. As far as I know, no one grows them on a hill in Exmoor. I mean, it, it, it simply isn't possible. What we do know from the DEFRA data is about 66% of our land in the UK. And if we look at Scotland, that goes up to 89%, can't be usefully used for anything but grazing. So while we could put up greenhouses or do clever things with home gardening and gardens on top of blocks of flats and so on and so on. Frankly speaking, most of the best use of our land, um, the best use of a high proportion of our land in the UK is to put a grazing livestock on it. And if we lost that or had to put 
massive inputs in terms of irrigation, in terms of changing tillage, trying to level it, trying to drain it, um, massive amounts of fertilizer to make land where at the moment we can only grow grass suitable to grow corn or soy or avocados, let's say, um, we would have even bigger environmental impacts. So again, I think it's really important to communicate to the consumer that all land isn't the same. And if we've got a slope that looks like this and it's full of rocks and it's really, really dry or it's really, really wet, you know, not only can you not plough or till it, but you can't grow anything there either from a human food point of view. Yeah. OK, Joseph, any more? So just, um, yeah, just one or two things coming in. Bear with. Um, oh, they're all starting to come now. <laughs> um, I'll go with the, the, the last one first. Are food miles for the different types of food included in their carbon footprint? Oh, good question. Um, well, carbon footprints, and again, I know that Leah's going to come on to this, but they do vary. And now, the best ones would have the carbon, the, the carbon footprint of the transportation included. Generally speaking, they don't. Generally speaking, it's to the farm gate or to the abattoir door, let's say. They don't generally include the transport to the retail shell, um, shell, for example. And we do know that transportation of the actual finished product generally speaking, is a really small proportion of the total carbon footprint. So that's not to say that local food isn't fabulous, because it absolutely is. But transportation of that food, generally speaking, because we have good infrastructure, because we have good motorways and transport, we don't tend to see that as a huge proportion of the carbon footprint compared to other components of it. And... The next one is, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, is a clover rich sward better at the absorption of carbon than grass alone? Oh, I can't definitively answer it. I can see that there would be some logic in that. And I'm having to go back to my soil and crop science, which is not my hottest thing. I kind of feel like Dave might have a better answer on that, frankly. I mean, I can guess and say potentially yes, depending how you manage it, but that's a little bit of a cop-out answer from me, frankly. <laughs> Any thoughts, Dave? I, I honestly don't know either, to be honest. <laughs> I guess a, I guess a clover-rich pasture uh, should, in theory, rear stock quicker, thus more efficiently. Yeah. Um, should help in the calculation. I mean, we certainly those of us uh, rearing lambs to finish know the difference. Um, uh, what happens when the clover appears in the spring and, and conversely what happens when it disappears in October, November and the lamb daily, daily live rate gains plummet off a cliff. Um, so yeah, I, I would have thought from the point of view of finishing stock quicker and more efficiently then clover should make a big difference. And then just the, the last one for now, um, do you have any information or experience of adapting uh, silvio pastoral or agroforestry systems in the UK? Um, seen in South America? I don't personally, um, but from what I've read, they can be very beneficial. Again, depending on the system, depending on the market. Um, if you have a grazing system and you don't have to obviously get big machinery in there, particularly often, um, planting trees can obviously have huge benefits. Whether um, you'll, some of you will be aware that there was a report from the um, Committee on Climate Change that came out um, a few months ago now, and they claim that we should be planting trees on about 20% of our UK land. That's great on land where we can accommodate that, you know, turning land where we currently grow, let's say, wheat into a forest, you know, is going to have negative in impacts on food security and sustainability. So trees are absolutely fabulous where the system allows. I don't think they're always the answer on, you know, every single farm and every single every single field. Jude, what about water? Yep. Because I see a lot of negative connotations associated with to produce a kilogram of beef, it takes X litres of water to do so. What can you tell us about that? So this is a little bit of one of those myths. Do you remember there was a BBC documentary came out a couple of months ago now, caused yep. a <laughs> lot of stir, um, basically implied that the systems we have here in the UK are identical to the systems that they have in the USA and other areas of the world. And simply speaking, we don't. Um, we have a very, in my view, 
sustainable beef industry and other livestock industry over here, which is very different to all over the world. The problem is we have so much information now, we can access information so quickly. That means misinformation also gets out there. And the water figures that we often see, and it'll be something like, for example, it takes, you know, 4,000 litres of water to make a kilo of beef. That will be based on, A, studies often done without due regard for animal productivity. And secondly, often US-based. Now, US farming is great. I'm not going to bash it at all. I actually worked over there for eight and a half years, but about 95% of their water footprint per kilo of beef actually comes from irrigation. They use huge amounts of water for irrigation. And as we know here, generally speaking, we don't have to irrigate because we have a heck of a lot of rain, <laughs> generally. Um, so our water footprint in the UK is far, far, far lower, about tenfold lower per kilo of beef. And we really have to help people understand that when they see images, when they see videos, when they see bits of data that says, you know, beef production as a whole, that sort of global average or that average from other systems doesn't apply to our systems over here. And um, whilst we're on the subject of our unique environment and how um, beef and lamb production over here is a lot different to other places in the world and it looks idyllic, there is that negative connotation that we import a lot of our animal feed. So there's a lot of air miles attached to that. To be honest, going forwards, I think homegrown feeds, byproduct feeds are going to be increasingly important. I think it's going to be very, very important as a whole food and fibre industry, i.e. all of the crops produced in the UK to make the best use of those versus importing feed. Now, that's not to say that there are any, you know, demon feeds, as it were. Soya often gets bashed as a feed. Obviously, it's um, a very good livestock feed in terms of the protein quality, for example. But it depends where you source that soya from as to its implications in terms of biodiversity loss, rainforest, etc., Honestly speaking, moving forward, I think in, let's say, 10 years time, we may not be feeding soya to livestock and we are going to have to increase our reliance on other byproduct feeds. And that's simply because soy has become this sort of bad word, as it were. Um, any anti-livestock article in the media always seems to say, and of course, cattle eat all the soy. And it honestly isn't as simple as that but it's become as simple as that in a in an awful lot of people's minds um so we are going to have to find alternatives i think and preferably ones obviously produced here just to cut the transport and costs both in terms of economic cost but also a greenhouse gas emissions as well the of those people that are, are we could term the anti-meat brigade, the, the small but noisy population. Yes. They spread a lot of myths and we hear a lot from them. But I think it's important to note that there are a percentage of the population that they may not be anti-meat, but they might just not have that education and understand how we produce our livestock. How or what advice would you have for farmers to empower them in order to engage with the public and educate others? I think we have to be clear that we're not, I always get a bit touchy about the word educate because you can sort of only educate people if they want to be educated. Yeah. But I think having the conversation and just understanding people's concerns and then trying to address them is really, really important. And as an industry, we do have to face the fact that sometimes we can't answer every question or we can't comply with every concern you know not every dairy farm can have cows out every single day all year round for example it just can't happen on some farms um and we aren't perfect you know none of us are perfect everybody has something going on um that's potentially not perfect from an economic point of view from a social point of view from an environmental point of view and how i think about it is it if you had a camera on your farm all the time, looking at you, your animals, your staff, your fertilizer use, your fuel, you know, everything else, would you be comfortable with that? And if you aren't, what are the things that perhaps you should be changing or be thinking about changing? 
But when we're talking to consumers, I think the biggest thing that we can do I mean, I'm a scientist and I tend to sort of lead with, well, the science says, you know, number, 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 number. And when I'm talking to people outside the industry, I have to step back and sort of become a bit more, what are your concerns? What do you want to understand about beef or lamb or dairy or whatever it might be? Um, why do you think that issue X is an issue? And share my values and say, well, as a parent, as a person who cares about the local community, as a person who wants safe, affordable food, as a person who wants my daughter to grow up in a world where everything's happy and healthy, as it were, this is why I do, you know, ABC. And I think overcoming that big gap that we've often got between the perception that, you know, farmers are out there with their four by fours, you know, killing the planet. I mean, it absolutely isn't true, but we've got to help people understand that we have kids, we care about the community, we care about animals, we care about the planet, and therefore this is why we do these things. Um, and if we share our values like that, generally the conversations go far better than a sort of wading in and saying, well, I saw this paper and it said that 27 percent decrease, blah, blah, blah. People are lost. They don't care about the science if they don't understand your values in telling them about the science. I think that's a really key point. Just before we start back, um, like all best laid plans, uh, some people I think might be struggling to uh, um, to ask questions, so I, I wish I knew the answer why, but I don't. Um, so if if there is people who want to ask questions, I'm going to type in my email address if people have any burning questions they want to send through. Um, it may look like I'm going to be distracted, but I am trying to, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll manage them as best I can. Um, so apologies for that, I'm not really sure why, but I know some questions are come, coming through and some aren't. Um, so I'll I'll type in my email address, so it's, it's joseph.keating at ahdb.org.uk. And if some people can't, and again, apologies, uh, all less best laid plans, we're trying to figure out this as we go. Um, but while uh, people are maybe emailing some questions, I have some nice simple ones for you, for you, Jude. Um, do you th think it's right uh, schools are taught to eat red meat in moderation, not each day would have a positive effect on global warming in the long term? Oh, good question. I think, honestly, um, everything should be in moderation. In fact, this, this is completely random, but I seem to remember that on the Chris Moyles breakfast show about 20 years ago, they had a catchphrase that was everything in moderation, including moderation, which always used to make me smile a bit. Um, honestly, we all need balanced diets. And whether we're eating too much potatoes or too much red meat or too much celery or too much tofu, you know, that isn't ever going to be a good thing. I think the danger become um, comes in when we say you should not eat food X, whatever food X is. I think the key is balance. The key is moderation. The key is having a balanced diet and the key is valuing all, all the nutrients that we have in red meat. And if we do that, it's absolutely part of a balanced diet. Does that mean that we all need to eat a kilo of it every single day? No, but we don't also need a kilo of bread every day or a kilo of apples every day. It's absolutely all about balance. Um, honestly, what I'm more concerned by, and I, there was an example of this just this just today, I think it was in New Zealand, I saw it on Twitter, um, where schools are going meat-free or on a particular day. Um, my daughter's school, for example, has a two different meat options every day. Oh, I think Jude's internet may have just gone, but that's okay. I think we'll move on if that's okay. And Dave, if you can come off mute, um, I will put up our slides again. Yep, sure. So, Dave, if I bring you in now, could you tell us a bit more about this slide? So I've, I've put some photos on that you kindly sent across to me. So they're your stock, aren't they? Yep, yep. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the picture of the cows, are that's our outwintered uh, suckler herd. Um, outwinter on uh, basically heather, gorse and 
that's the that's the one little bit of grass they're allowed, and there's a picture of them on it. Um, the rest, as you can see, is a bit rough. Um, works very well for us. Uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, be able to do that. Um, the right hand slide is the front cover of our Exmoor Ambition um, document, uh, which is hopefully quite a nice, easy to read document, um, but it's fairly comprehensive. Um, we were one of the very first um, organisations to, to get something like that, get a sort of a very cohesive um, sort of document like that into, into DEFRA. We sort of, the plan was to try and sort of preempt DEFRA's thinking of what they wanted to do in the future by perhaps just nudging in what we would like to see in the future. And um, so far, it's, it, it, you know, we, we've made a fair bit of headway and, and, and hopefully we're... Um, when we are influencing some, some, some of the policy makers, but we, 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 we will await to see how that pans out. So um, how did it come about then? Did someone ask Exmoor to produce this document or did you get together and decide it was needed? Um, no, absolutely. We weren't asked, asked by anyone. Uh, it, it, it literally started as uh, a bit of chit chat, which progressed to uh, round the table sort of meeting and it snowballed. Uh, uh, well, snowball from there to, as it, as people got sort of more excited with it. Um, the national park sort of listened, heard us out. They got on board um, with quite with you know with some funding to help us get, but you know not just funding, a lot of resources as well. Um, and it's just yeah, it's just snowballed um, really from there. Uh, keep waiting for someone to tell us no, it can't possibly be done. Farmers leading the way, um, and to tell us to <laughs> shut up and go back to Exmoor basically. But uh, it hasn't happened as of yet. Um, probably our big, big success was getting uh, Michael Gove when he was um, when he was uh, Secretary of State at Defra down to Exmoor um, to hear us out. In, in effect, uh, and we got a lot of local MPs involved, at, you know, there on the day as well, uh, which was very good, really good. Uh, we've had uh, a, quite a, lot, a few meetings, uh, field days, I guess, on Exmoor with some quite high-ranking Defra staff since then and try and put, sort of push our ideas over um yeah it just get we just going to keep pushing with it until someone tells us tells us to go away really it sounds like it's been well received then yeah 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 so far it seems to have been very well received good good um so i've been in touch with um Catherine from the Exmoor Hill Farming Network yep. and um, she's done a little bit of work for me behind the scenes um, and Holly Purdy from Horner Farm on Exmoor has kindly sent us in some pictures so I wonder if you could just talk us through these. Yeah sure so um, Holly is one of my what was it is a fellow tenant of mine uh, on um, on the same estate as me uh, so this is uh, and, and yeah they are they are the newest tenants on the estate um their farm was relet um only a few years ago so they are yeah so that they are a fresh a fresh uh, a fresh approach on the estate um so this is an ex example of healthy manure with evidence of dung beetle activity um which uh have often been um in decline um well with intensive farming practices you know i think i think we often know know that some some of the um Treatment treatment used on livestock that can can have a uh, a negative effect on dung beetle populations. Um, so yeah, so this is what we like to see as livestock farmers: uh, a nice, healthy dung like this, we're supporting a lot of life. And how about this one? Um, so this is a multi-species sward, um, which are which our landlord, uh, the National Trust, would have been keen to have seen that put in. Um, so it's, it's we we farm we all farm on a very dry estate uh so the idea behind it would have been to have got some drought drought resistance um uh also deep rooting to bring minerals up um to positive for animal health and soil health uh which then lowers the need for additional inputs um such as wormers and hopefully antibiotics um uh, so species here are trefoils uh etc and apparently trefoils can reduce methane emissions interesting and what about this one? Uh, so, this is uh, one of the one of the members of the flock down at Horner, uh, and uh, I know that Holly's quite keen already to um, to seek nutritional products that don't do not contain any soy, palm oil, or um, GMO ingredients. And I I believe this is a bucket that doesn't doesn't uh, include any of that, uh, and which is the name of Holly's. 
OK, Joseph, have there been any questions for Dave so far? I'm just going on to the. Uh, there's one or two emails coming in, so thanks for those who are who are sending them. And again, apologies. Um, I wish I knew what was wrong, but anyways, uh, just on going back to your Exmoor uh, ambitions, uh, Dave, how do you feel our it was basically coordinated by farmers. How important do you feel it is that you own your kind of own story and own your own environmental story? Uh, from a farmer's point of view, I think it's incredibly important. Uh, just just so you know, the, the, the level of support we've had from the farming community of Exmoor, uh, you wouldn't believe really, you just, you just wouldn't believe how engaging they've got in it because it's farmer led uh, and it's, it, it's led by them in effect. Um, in terms of approaching DEFRA, but also in, in terms of uh, approaching other organisations to get their support, uh, it, it has really been that the message we've been told back time and time again is how refreshing it is to have farmers coming forward with their ideas. Um, you know, not not uh, the the big organisations, you know, national trusts, RSPBs, etc. Um, we you know with with relatively uh, large lobbying budgets. You know, this this is coming up from <laughs> basically no budget whatsoever. This is this is farmers just trying to lead the way and saying, hold on a second. We're, we're, most of us have spent 20 to 30 years uh, with environmental schemes. We're, we're the experts on this. Uh, you know, give us, give us a, give us a say at least, uh, if not, if not the lead on, on how we'd like um, these schemes to pan out in the future. And then with the, um, you say you're in terms of the schemes. Have you have any successes in terms of some of those new schemes? that DEFRA are trying to pilot? Um, so yeah, so we on Exmoor, we are one of the tests and trials um, and our subject, I guess, or topic uh, for the test and trial is is um, natural capital, which as, as many of us know is, is the current buzz phrase. Uh, so we have uh, nearly 30 farms in that trial uh, currently on a, on a standby while the, while the current situation sort of works itself out. But yeah, hopefully we'll start seeing um, some results from that later this year, uh, which we should hopefully be very good. Um, next step on from there, we don't know. We we would love we would love to be handed um, a proper trial of, of the Exmoor ambition, uh, but you know how, how that's gonna how we're gonna get there and whether we'll get there, I don't know. Oh, Joseph, you're on mute. Here's me trying breaking the rules. Um, one for you, Dave. Uh, I know it wasn't on your farm exactly, but um, do you know what they're doing to encourage dung beetles? Um, is it as simple as stop using pesticides or is there a particular problem for the beetles? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I, I would have thought it's um, it's it's just uh, probably the main two would be stopping using ivermectrins. Uh, I, I imagine um, would be a, would be the main one. Um, as National Trust tenants, we don't actually, we, we don't, we, we aren't actually. We don't tend to use ivermectins anyway. Um, and normally, in a grazing license, it is actually specified no ivermectins um, are given to the stock on that grazing ground. Um, that would be one pesticides. Maybe I, this is probably a little bit a uh, bit out of my knowledge uh, scope. Well, well, um, I was, well, however, watching uh, a program from New Zealand a little while ago where they were actually in, uh, introducing dumb beetles um, to. Um, to bump the numbers up, but what, I, I don't think that's been done locally. But it is it, perhaps that is a, it is something that does have some potential. Well, we, we won't hold you to to the all the answer. Um, <laughs> I, I do have one question. If I hopefully Jude is Jude is back back with us. Actually, figures out how to unmute. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so just I think actually you you started answering it. But I'll I'll ask I'll ask the question so so people can hear. Um, yeah. it was around re reducing food waste, uh, meat or milk, either in the production chains or at packer consumer supermarkets, be a better approach towards sustainability, and not only focus on the carbon emissions, water use in meat, meat and milk. Good question, and my answer is it is part of the solution it isn't the solution so on a global level we know that about a third of food gets wasted 
Um, where that third is wasted depends on the region. So, for example, in the low income countries, that's often because crops don't get harvested, you know, animals die early, et cetera. And um, over here, it tends to be more at the retail and the consumer end. Um, so, yes, we have to wait. Um, yes, we have to improve waste. Now, in terms of milk and meat, they're actually one of the less wasted foods, as it were particularly meat, and presumably that's linked to economic cost. Um, if we look at an individual household, we tend to see more waste in terms of bakery goods and fruit and vegetables than we do in milk or meat, but ultimately anything that we can do throughout the chain. So yes, if we eliminated all food waste instantly, we'd make great improvements, but that doesn't mean there isn't a silver bullet, you know? There isn't any just one simple thing that we can all do that will solve the problems apart from doing everything better. If we all farm better, consume better, buy better, that will make a difference. But there's no simple one thing that, that will make that happen. Um, and just one question that got e emailed in. Uh, should we have better food labelling in terms of nutrient density? I think it would be great. However, it's only as good as whether people read it or not. And quite a lot of the consumer social science data says that people go into the supermarket and they spend a really short time deciding which meat, which milk, which eggs, which other foods to buy. And generally they buy on brand, they buy on previous experience, taste, etc. They buy on price. You know, if it comes down to it and they've got time to look at the nutrient composition of product A versus product B, then they will look, but it's a relatively small proportion of people who actually have that time. Um, as a person with a six-year-old daughter, on the rare occasions that I do take her to Sainsbury's, you know, I don't have the time to look at the labels, honestly. I just buy the things that I generally buy. So it would be great, but only if people are pointed to actually looking at those labels and understanding those labels. Because if they don't, frankly, it would cost us as an industry an awful lot of money if it's not going to be used. And then just finally for now, because I know uh, Leon's just briefly mentioned the, the carbon audit side of things. Uh, one for Dave, um, what are the biggest challenges right now facing Exmoor farmers and what support would you like to see? Uh, I guess uh, biggest challenges uh, from a livestock point of view, um, uh, the goings on the last couple of days, I guess, as beef, beef farmers, we're, we're, we're slightly concerned. Um, uh, perhaps not so much with the lambs. I mean, you know, current trade in lambs, we're, we're, you know, is, is relatively good. Um, um, what the next year holds, I don't know. Uh, in terms of support, um, the, the overriding thing that will, will come up time and time again uh, on Exmoor is uh, capital grants is a big one. We have a very, very hedged uh, landscape on Exmoor. Um, and the reality is, as much as we, we want to look after those hedges, we, we love those hedges, uh, they are extremely expensive to maintain in whatever format you want to maintain them in. They are extremely expensive, uh, particularly in the ideal format where you are uh, letting them grow up um, and then laying them every, say, 10, 15 years, uh, that, that requires a lot of labour. It supports a lot of local jobs. But re in reality, uh, under the current farming climate, there isn't always the spare money from production to allow that to happen. Uh, so that sort of support that maintains the landscape, uh, the, the wider benefits are tourism by a long, long way. Uh, people come to act more very much because of what it offers in terms of landscape views, etc. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, I guess um, capital grants is a big one. It would be a big ask for us on Exmoor uh, just to just to keep just to level out how um, how works go on on the moor. Um, you know, uh, yeah. I'm going to put some of those photos back up. Um, let's find the right one. Hopefully you can see that there. So just going back to these days, what, what can you say about this photo? Uh, so this is uh, the flock down at Horner. Um, uh, Horner likes to utilize native breeds um, on a grass-based system uh, here on Exmoor, uh, ideally to reduce the need for concentrates um, 
and ideally for the cattle that they would live uh, out all year round, um, out wintering livestock on a grass pace based system, um, ideally with no, with no imported grain, I believe is their aim. Do you see that a lot on Exmoor, a lot of um, native breeds? Uh, yes, the tip, typical Exmoor, um, uh, I suppose, beef system will be selling stores uh, uh, anywhere between sort of six six months, well, off the cow, basically, so I suppose eight months to a year old, sometimes a bit older. Um, and often it, it will be a native cow, which is often the, the, the ruby red Devon. Um, and, uh, but put to a Charolais, Exmoor is particularly well known as producing extremely good Charolais cattle uh, and people come from all over the country to buy um, Charolais, uh, Sturks, etc. from our local market, which I should also say is farmer owned and farmer run. Um, so yes, we do see quite a lot of native cattle. Uh, we run Hereford's and Angus here. Um, there's a little bit a lot in terms of the in terms of the cow, certainly. Um, sheep, uh, still a lot of the native breed, um, Exmoor Horn, and by extension, the Exmoor Mules. Uh, giving ground a little, possibly now, to, to cleanse Romneys, etc. But, um, yeah, still a lot of Exmoor Horns about. Um, yeah, and the, the, the Ruby Red Devons are extremely strong on Exmoor, extremely strong. Um, we, we've just touched on um, hedges and the challenge that you're facing on Exmoor, but what are the positives for the environment that maintaining your hedges or planting new hedges would give? Uh, yeah, so um, the positives, I suppose, for the environment is is habitat. Um, you know, hedges typically, if they're in a scheme or there is the money available to do it, uh, will be will be fenced both sides if they're an internal or just fence one side if they're a road. So of course it's not just the hedge. You've got the an Exmoor hedge is typically, although not in this picture, will typically be a five or six or even seven or eight foot tall bank with a with a hedge on top of it again. So if you've double fenced it, you've also got uh, a lot of bank uh, area that is also ungrazed, um, which also supports a huge amount of flowers. Um, and small animals, etc. And of course, the hedge supports bird life on top of that. Um, here is a picture of a new is, is newly planted hedges to subdivide fields that that historically would have been much smaller anyway. Um, but in the part of the road where we are, uh, the low, lowland field, well, like here, lowland fields would have been historically elm hedges. Um, they, of course, all died. Um, and then the government at the, the, at the time subsidised bulldozing what remained of the banks out. Um, so these new hedges going in obviously aren't elm uh, this time round, uh, but the the aim is to subdivide fields again. Um, uh, in this case, as an alternative to electric fencing, so there's a lot of hedgerows have gone in on this particular farm uh, to make to make smaller paddocks um, uh, to help with sort of rotational grazing, I guess, um, and also uh, it connects the landscape up. I I suppose. Um, connects the various woodland blocks up, the more hedges that are in it, the more corridors. Um, offers, and from a farming point of view, of course, it offers shade, uh, it, it breaks the wind up, it offers shelter. Um, if the stock can reach reach any parts of the hedge, it offers an alternative uh, source of food um, as well. And um, this looks more like trees than hedges. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, Silvio Pastor, I believe, um, uh, which is also, there's been a fair bit of interest in that locally um, and on this particular farm, quite a lot's gone in. Uh, so it's, um, I guess it's grass and trees are treated as crops via rotational grazing. Um, this, this should increase soil health um, and increases productivity, um, which again should lower the need for concentrates and medicines. Uh, and again, you know, in, in time should provide um, shade and also um, browsing fodder for livestock, um, which, yeah, there is there is quite a lot of work to show uh, the benefits of, of stock being able to browse, bro browse sort of particular trees as well, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, and there is also the potential that if you had fruit trees, you could actually have another crop as well as your grass and you've got another crop on top of that. Yeah. And well, th this is me, isn't it? But do you think um, is this qu quite common to see on Exmoor that you're doing lots of selling your own? 
there's a reasonable bit of it. Um, yes, uh, they're doing some down Horner. Um, we've also there's some so we've also got some friends who are doing it on the other side of the moor. And yes, so yes, it is being done. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't try pretend that every other farmer's doing it, but it yeah. is being done. Um, what we are doing, which is of particular interest um, at the minute, is trying to get uh, a sort of an Exmoor lamb project off the ground. Um, so although that won't quite be um, like this farm selling, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one farm selling to, to the public like that, it, it's it's trying to put an extra connection in um, for for sort of a uh, well, I guess I guess a, a branded Exmoor lamb, which is is really exciting at the minute, and, uh, and there's a lot of us very excited about the prospects for that. Um, and these are not cattle or sheep. No, so Horn, Horn has got some goats. Um, I think they're probably the only tenants with goats, actually, uh, which is really interesting. Um, so multi-species grazing, uh, grazing cattle, sheep and goats together to maximise the results of the grassland. Um, different livestock species target different grass and forage species. And this ensures, hopefully, that grassland is better utilised, especially those multi-species uh, days that we saw earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dave. Um, we're running out of time quite quickly, so I'm going to whip through a few more slides and then, Joseph, if there are any more questions, we'll come back to them afterwards, I think. So um, I wanted to briefly touch on carbon footprinting or auditing tools because it seems to be becoming trendier um, as the environment is becoming more of a hot topic, I suppose. Um, and as my role within the Southwest, I've been asked a number of times what carbon footprint tool could I use or um, what, what should I be looking to do? So um, there are a lot out there. Uh, you, you may have done some research yourself or you might know someone that's looked at their own carbon footprint, but th there are a lot of different tools out there and it's quite a minefield to choose one that suits you. So I just wanted to draw your attention to a comparative analysis that was done by Scotland's Rural College, where they compared um, a number of different tools um, to see the differences between them. Um, and a similar um, comparison is on the uh, Championing the Farmed Environments website. So there's a tool comparison table on there. Um, and what I'll do is following this presentation, we'll send you out a link um, via email or all the links to any resources we've talked about today. So you can look them up if you if you wish to. Um, I spoke to one of the authors of uh, the SRUC's comparative analysis earlier this week, and I asked for his key message of the of, of the report. And he said, if you're looking into doing this, you need to choose a carbon tool that's right for you and your system. You might be a farmer, you might be a consultant, but the tool needs to be right for you. And systems differ so much, so it has to be right for your system. Um, but given all the photos we've just seen and all the amazing work that's going on in Exmoor, you have to remember that there's more to your farm than your carbon footprint. So don't feel pressured into a position where you need to be documenting that. Um, at AHDB on the website, we've got um, a, a whole number of resources that may help you defend um, what you do, um, whether that's on social media or if you want to enlighten someone or um, if you just want to share with friends. So uh, you can find a number of different infographics on the website. And um, we're in the process of creating some more infographics on uh, the positive role of livestock on the environment. So they'll be uploaded shortly. Um, there's, there's a wide variety on there. Um, if you, we, we've recently updated our website, so this is what you'll look like, what it will look like on our landing page, and a lot of what I've talked about this evening will be on that knowledge library there. So under that tab, if you were to search in that keywords box or that search bar, um, you should be able to find what you're looking for. If if there's ever a point where you can't find what you're looking for, please just get in touch with one of us and we can help you. But for example, under that knowledge library, um, if you type in red meat and the environment, the facts, it will come up with a, with a number of facts and links to those infographics. It also comes up with a link to a document called Landscapes Without Livestock, which is a good read. Um, on our website, we also have a number of webinars and podcasts, and we are in the process of creating a page of frequently asked questions on livestock and the environment. 
Um, and if you'd like to feed into that, please do get in touch with us um, and ask your questions and we'll find the answers for those and put them on there. Um, like I said, we'll send you up a follow e follow up email uh, with this information and the links, including the one from the SIUC's comparative analysis and the um, championing the farmed environments tool comparison table. And I also wanted to draw your attention to our next table talk, which is on Thursday, the 28th of May at 7.30 p.m titled Hill Weather Lambs Byproduct or Opportunity, and this is linking to the Swaledale project. Um, all of our other meetings can be found on our website, um, and I will just quickly run through some take home messages from this evening before we finish up with answering a few more questions, if there are any. So I think we all need to be better at talking about what we do on farm and why we do it. Jude, would you agree with that one? Yeah, absolutely. Totally. I think it's absolutely key. If we can't explain why we do what we do and why it's important for all of us in the UK, um, then I think we're in trouble. So, yeah, totally. Thank you. Um, we know as well the UK is one of the most sustainable places in the world to produce beef and lamb. Grazing cattle and sheep aids biodiversity and manages our unique countryside. Without grazing ruminants, more than 60% of agricultural land in the UK would be taken out of food production because it's not suitable for cropping. Grazing ruminants help manage permanent pasture, which is an effective carbon sink. And if you're looking into your carbon footprint, then choose a carbon tool that's right for you and your system. But remember, there is more to your farm than your carbon footprint. So if there are any more questions, we'll go through those now. Yes, so there's um, just one or two quick ones so we we probably have 10 minutes if, if people do have questions they want to ask um but we won't make it longer than it has to be but we talk about a lot of, um a lot about carbon uh, carbon footprinting um and obviously i think on the environment we always separate them um from production and what you do on farm so how how important it is is it to link you know how you farm your production just not just to the carbon footprint but also to your environment to both Dave and Jude. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Sounds technical, Jude. I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, well, even though I said earlier that we shouldn't lead with the science in this um, audience, I feel I probably can lead with the science. Um, so science shows that in any system. So it doesn't matter what your breed is. It doesn't matter where you're based. It doesn't matter how big your herd is, what you feed them. If we improve productivity, we are going to have a positive impact on cutting greenhouse gas emissions, cutting land use, cutting water use. And if we also add in things that will improve biodiversity, for example, soil quality, we can have a really good, um, really good effect. I think it's it's absolutely right. I mean, if I go back to when I first started working on um, carbon footprints, that was actually in dairy back when I was at Cornell University in 2006 or so. It was very much, well, the carbon footprint people work over there and we're the animal science people that work here and we don't mix together, you know, and I think we really have to understand better and bear in mind that whenever we're trying to improve productivity to have a better economic output, for example, that will have really positive effects for the environment as well. Thank you. Um, and just going through the last few questions that I may, may have missed as we went through. So one was, well, was probably more for AHDB. Um, can we also engage with universities, um, especially those not land-based, to help educate the lecturers on policy matters to get a more balanced view. Um, AHDB, we do have a number of resources, not directed at university level, um, but we do uh, run the website uh, Foods Facts for Life. Um, we can add that to the email. I will send that through. Um, so we do try and target uh, teachers and create some uh, balanced facts uh, across both red meat and, and fruit and veg um, to promote uh, a more balanced discussion. Um, and that happens. As that has been well received uh, across the across the industry. I don't have the numbers, but I know the last few months, especially the last few months, they've been really drawing on those on those resources. So I've just sent that like link through, and we'll we'll add it in. Um, quick one for you, Dave, and you might not know the answer, but do you know, did you know what trees they were planting in? Uh, that, uh, 
I don't actually, to be honest. Um, there is a lot of use of chestnut on this estate, so uh, probably some chestnut, but uh, I'll be honest and say I don't actually know. Unless we get any more questions, I think the final one is a bit was more of a statement and it was referring to um, to the uh, Scottish Highlands and uh, the quality of the cattle up there. But given that we're the English levy body, I'm sure, Dave, you would say that Exmoor is, uh, is better. Oh, I, I invite anyone to come down to one of our uh, our annual, big annual sales um, on Exmoor at uh, Exmoor Livestock Auctioneers uh, or Exmoor uh, Market um, and see the cattle for themselves. And I, I, I think they will agree uh, agree with my statement that Exmoor does have some rather marvellous cattle. I think, I, th I think that could be the most controversial thing we've said <laughs> all night. Um, and then our, our colleague uh, John has just also highlighted the point we do work at across uh, purchasing managers um, to talk about sustainability and about red meat. So obviously we're just talking about our small bit of our role, but we do work uh, across different parts of the supply chain as well to promote and uh, to get a more balanced view and facts out there. Um, but that's all the questions I have, I think. Hopefully I haven't missed any. Um, okay, so brilliant. Yes. I think we'll wrap it up there then, if that's OK. So thank you very much, Jude, for joining us this evening. And thank you, Dave and the Exmoor Hill Farming Network, as well as Catherine and Holly for helping with the photos. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for joining today. Um, you may leave when you're ready. I will pop up some instructions on how to do so, just in case. It's a, it's a simple <laughs> guide, um, but I, I, I will end it. Uh, uh, properly. Uh, and again, apologies for the for the questions. Hopefully, those who did want to did want to ask, uh, managed to do so. But we'll 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 eventually get the hang of all these different technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been really fun. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Jude. Hope everyone has a good night. Sure. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank, thank you, everyone.